Coming up on DTNS, Samsung shuts down its China phone plant. People are getting faster at typing on mobile, except for me, and Microsoft got back into phones. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 2nd, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In Salt Lake City, hitting my F8 key, I'm Scott Johnson. And uh, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, Sarah's out, but she will be back tomorrow. Do not fret. Uh, just now on Good Day Internet, we were talking nutrition. A lot, of, a lot of scientific studies are out. We were kicking those around, talking about nutritional advice. Uh, if that sounds like something you would be interested in, you can go listen to that episode by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's start with a few tech things you should know. Samsung has shut down its last phone factory in China. Uh, it's citing domestic competition from Chinese brands, rising labor costs, and a slowing worldwide phone market as reasons for pulling out of China. Samsung expanded its smartphone production to countries like India and Vietnam, so it's still making its phones. It's just making them somewhere else. Uh, Sony also recently announced it's closing its Beijing smartphone plant and will only make Sony phones in Thailand. Interesting. That is a real shift. Uh, Google announced Action Blocks uh, to let you create shortcuts of a multi-step task you might have. You got a bunch of stuff you got to get done? Use Action Blocks. Using Google Assistant is how you'll do it. Google is promoting Action Blocks as an accessibility feature for people with cognitive disabilities like advanced dementia, autism, or Down syndrome. Uh, to get Action Blocks, you need to be part of Google's trusted tester program. Intel announced a refresh to its high-end Skylake i9 processors. The Cascade Lake processors are the name of that refreshed line, and they're cheaper. Uh, coming in November, as an example, the Skylake $1,979-9980XE will be replaced by the Cascade Lake 10980XE for $979. So quite a quite a discount there. Uh, and you even get an increased turbo mode from 4.5 to 4.8 gigahertz. The Core i9-10900X is even cheaper. Uh, increasing base clock speed from 3.5 to 3.7 gigahertz and dropping the price from $989 to $599. Uh, quoted prices from Intel, of course, are for 1,000-unit orders, not your single-chip retail. So you'll probably end up paying a little bit more if you build your own machine. Uh, but it will bring down the price of machines that are made with these processors as well. Well, the Wall Street Journal has sources who say the companies that make up the Libra Association will meet in Washington, D.C. on Thursday. That would be tomorrow. The journal's uh, sources say Visa and MasterCard are reconsidering involvement. Bloomberg source uh, says that PayPal and Stripe are also undecided. Facebook's David Marcus said on Twitter he was not aware of any company's plans to not step up, was his quote. All right. Well, uh, see what leaks out of that meeting. Uh, Instagram is rolling out its restrict tool to all users to restrict a user instead of blocking them. You swipe left on a comment or go to a user's profile page or you can go into the privacy tab in Instagram settings. Restricted users' comments remain visible to them. That's the difference with blocking, but will not show up for anyone else who, use, who views your post unless you approve them. DMs from restricted users will also go to your message request inbox and you won't get a notification and the sender won't know if you've read it or not. Wow. That's a super interesting thing, actually. I kind of hope more people do that. It's like muting and you'll never know. And you're not just muting him. You're muting. You're being muted from the world. Ah! Mm -hmm. uh, Apple also announced it will update iOS later this year to let third party messaging apps work with Siri by default. It's a big change. Right now, uh, only iOS own messaging apps work by default, meaning users have to specify apps like WhatsApp if they want to send a message that way. The update will default to send messages to the app used most frequently. I hope there's a setting in there that lets me choose a default app as well. Uh, that's unclear at this point. Uh, but I do like the feature of if I don't want to choose, just saying like, well, we know you always use WhatsApp, so we'll just default to that one. Yeah, seems nice. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about what Google's doing for Cybersecurity Month. Well, a couple things going on. Google added a password checkup feature to its password manager in Chrome and Android. The feature was previously available as an extension, and it checks passwords against known breaches and alerts users if it finds a match, as well as encouraging users against reusing passwords or using weak passwords. Uh, data is encrypted and cannot be seen by Google, and the warnings it generates are local to your machine. So only you're going to see these. 
Yeah, and they encrypt uh, and hash the passwords when they do the comparison. So, so they're trying to do all the things to reassure you that you know they're not just letting your passwords out into the world when they check them, which is important. Uh, this is no different than Have I Been Pwned, where you can you can look and find out like, hey, is uh, this is my username? Is there a password associate that's been out on a breach? But it's a little more automatic, and it's built into Chrome and Android. So it seems like if you are going to use Chrome and Android. Uh, in this way, then this is a great idea. Whether you should use Chrome and Android to store your passwords or log into things, that's a whole separate conversation. But if you are, it's a good good feature, right? Yeah, I totally agree. Well, they're not done because Google also uh, launched incognito mode for Maps, and it's kind of what you think it is. When you use Google Maps in incognito mode, your activity will not be saved to your Google account or used for personalization. Google is also adding auto-delete options to your YouTube history that can be set for delivery every three to 18 months. I like that one a lot. And Google Assistant will now respond to voice commands to, quote, delete the last thing I said to you and, quote, delete everything I said to you last week. Those are both pretty cool. It's important to note, we talked about it earlier, uh, so probably should pound this a little bit. Uh, the incognito mode for Maps hides it from Google and hides it from them using it. It does not do anything to your ISP or how mm. you are conveying that information. So it's not like right. suddenly your mapping info is being encrypted and sent through Comcast and they have no idea. Uh, it's just when it gets to Google. And that's an important distinction, I think. Yeah, it's not a VPN, in other words. Uh, right. But it's a way for Google to say, hey, if you don't want us to count this location, it's like it's like when you decide to use incognito mode to search because you don't want it to affect the ads you get. Uh, it's like that for maps. Like, I'm going to go to this location, but I don't want suddenly that to affect all the things that Google does in personalization. I'm I'm sneakily going to a Yankees game, but I'm a Mets fan, and I don't want it to start giving me Yankees scores because it thought I went to a Yankees game. I'm really so. glad you said that because I've had the hardest time in my head constructing a viable uh, scenario where this would really matter to somebody because <laughs> I haven't really been able to figure it out. It's like, why would anyone care or why would I care what Google thought about where I went and your baseball analogy is actually really good. It's a. It's probably not the most uh, legitimate one or common one, but 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 it is. I yeah. I, th I think it kind of gets the idea across. Uh, right. Probably more often if you're like visiting somewhere, they're like, yeah, I'm never gonna go back there. I don't really want that. Um, who knows? Maybe it's going to a hospital or something like that. You just don't want that that health information into your profile. Mm -hmm. uh, scientists from universities in Finland, the UK, and Switzerland combined to present a study Wednesday showing that people type about 70% as fast on mobile devices as they do on physical QWERTY keyboards. Now, you could look at that and say, like, man, that's what I thought, slower on mobile. But it's a lot less slower on mobile than people expected. Uh, this is a pretty extensive study. They had 37,000 volunteers across 160 countries more female weighted and also younger, like people in their twenties. Uh, but they, you know, statistically, you know, averaged it out, took typing tests to assess speed and accuracy. Mobile typing averaged around 36 words per minute, while physical typing ranged from 35 to 65 words per minute. People who used two thumbs on mobile achieved the fastest mobile typing speeds, and about three quarters, 74% of participants used two thumbs to type on mobile. Uh, autocorrect, despite your frustrations with it, increased typing speed, but word prediction, where it tells you what word it thinks you want to type next, did not because of the time it takes you to choose the word. It might feel faster, but apparently it's not. Uh, and uh, another interesting note from this study, users between the ages of 10 and 19 typed an average of 10 words per minute faster on mobile than the olds in their 40s. <laughs> so Mavis Beacon could not be reached for comment on this article. <laughs> um, I, this is super interesting because I've noticed that, uh, this I've noticed this in my own kids. Um, they're all really fast at this. And I remember when, you know, uh, the just a little nine keypad thing was the way to do it on a crappy flip phone. And they were really fast at doing that. So my experience is with whatever my experience as a father was, is that kids latch onto this stuff because it's all they've seen. It's all they know. And especially when it comes to uh, touch screens, that is the default interface that a whole generation is growing up with. Like straight up when Nick was seven years old, he suddenly had touch screens. And it's been all that since now he's 19. Uh, that represents a huge part of his life's experience and memories. So that's just going to get faster. They're going to get better at it. The olds are going to get worse at it. And uh, this seems kind of normal to me, but it is fun to watch things like I watched a Fortnite tournament where a kid on his phone bested somebody who was equal skill in terms of, you know, how good they are at the game 
on a console and another person on a PC all in the same game, and he just rocked them on his cell phone. Um, I've seen others do similar stuff on on tablets and iPads and that sort of thing. They're just so much more used to that interface. Uh, and that we all use and love too. I mean, it's not that. It's just that they're going to be naturally slower. They're going to have a, uh, you know, an attunement to it that we're just not going to have. And I think it's pretty cool. It's kind of impressive. Yeah, I, I, there's something to be said for growing up with something, making making you better at it. Uh, you know, there were things that we were better at as kids uh, than than our parents and grandparents uh, because we were just faster at it. You know, things like VCRs, <laughs> sure. for instance, uh, skills that are no longer necessary. But I know this uh, is one thing they didn't talk about in here is you know the keyboards and the Android's got a lot of these. Um, you can now in the new ver version of iOS, it's actually built in, but the whole swipe mm -hmm. feature. I don't know if that played into this at all. No, it, it doesn't sound like it. They just wanted yeah. people to do like straight on typing versus typing. But that would be interesting if the swipe, I wish they would have had that in here. Is swiping actually make it faster? Maybe like word prediction, it doesn't. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Let's talk about Microsoft. Uh, they had a big announcement today in New York City. Uh, they had a lot of things that had been leaked this week earlier by Evan Blass. So a lot of it was not a surprise. But one thing was Microsoft announced it is getting back into the phone market. The Surface Duo is a dual screen foldable Android phone not with a screen that folds like the Galaxy Fold, but with two 5.6-inch displays. So clamshell device. It arrives by the holidays next year, 2020. Microsoft didn't really announce a whole lot more details about this. They also, right before they made the bombshell announcement of putting out a phone, uh, announced the Surface Neo. The Surface Neo is a dual-screen tablet with two 9-inch screens. That one runs Windows 10X. Uh, so not as revolutionary as Microsoft putting out an Android phone, but Windows 10X is a new version of Windows optimized for dual screen devices. Uh, it runs just native Windows apps, so 64-bit, although you can run Win32 uh, apps in a container. Each side is 5.6 millimeters thick, can rotate 360 degrees on the hinge, so you can flap it all the way open for two, two screens on each side. Uh, features a custom Intel Lake Field processor, referred to as a hybrid processor, with an 11th gen graphics engine to control both screens. The cool part, depending on if you didn't look too close at the woman's hands, because they seem to be kind of in a painful position, uh, was a Bluetooth keyboard attachment that sits on top of one screen part way, leaving the rest of that screen to be used as a trackpad. So it just kind of clacks on, uh, probably magnetically, and then it connects by Bluetooth and the Windows 10X knows that that's happened and then turns the rest of the screen into the trackpad. Uh, Windows 10X launches an app in the screen in which it's invoked. It can span apps across two screens. Most of the two screen functionality of Windows 10X was stuff that we've seen in things from Kyocera and other, other dual screen devices in the past. Uh, it will also work with the new Surface Pen that can attach to the back. Surface Neo will be available for the holidays next year, along with the Surface Duo for 2020. Uh, this is this is very interesting to me. This is uh, you can make any phone a Microsoft phone. You could install Office and Outlook, Microsoft's launcher, uh, and connect it to OneDrive. Any Android phone, anyway. Uh, Samsung has Microsoft's Your Phone built in at the system level. So I I think a lot of people just thought, well, that's Microsoft's approach to phones is just kind of take it over at that level. Um, this is a whole different opportunity. It makes more sense than Galaxy Fold. Uh, it certainly makes Google's support of dual screen devices make more sense. When they were talking about dual screen and, and we all thought, well, is that because of the Galaxy Fold? I guess Google must be coming out with their own thing. Now it makes more sense. Oh, they were developing this with Microsoft as well, which they were. And it really underlines Satya Nadella's plans for Microsoft. In fact, he out and out told Wired's Lauren Good, the operating system is no longer the most important layer for us. So yeah, this is uh, this is definitely a whole new world yeah. for Microsoft. I keep making this joke over the last day and a half about how how would Steve Ballmer <laughs> feel about this, and you were quick to point out he's too worried about his basketball team to worry about yeah, any huh. of this. And I think you're right, but uh, it is such a difference from that Microsoft where platform anonymity mattered, where they didn't want 
to have their stuff everywhere. There was no there was no push toward any of that. Uh, and in fact, they were still pushing Windows Phone. So to hear that they're finally back to a phone and that it doesn't have anything to do with Nokia and that it has a lot to do with Android is kind of nuts if you're looking at this thing on a macro level. Um, but I think it's actually perfectly in line with Microsoft's recent moves over the last few years. This is definitely a new kind of Microsoft, and they are definitely more about getting their name, their stuff, their services everywhere and less about controlling the platform it's on. And I still think that's really good for them. I mean, I just from a pure PR standpoint, I I like Microsoft more now than I ever have. And I think it's just because I these kind of moves just seem like nice, open, smart moves, good products. Customer good friendly moves. Yeah, all yeah. that stuff. Like that's that is not what I felt about them ten years ago. And yet here we are. It's kind of it's kind of crazy how that's gone. I I think you know it's not a surprise. Sachin Adele has been saying for two plus years, I guess five years. It's it's been five years since he took over. Uh, that that this was the direction of, of Microsoft is is services and software uh, and not the operating system level. But it's also hardware. It's also saying like we're going to make best in class prototype hardware that somehow has not angered its partners. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I would be tempted to say like, ooh, this is going to get Samsung upset, but it won't. Uh, any more than coming out with these laptops and, and tablets have, have made HP or or com <laughs> Compact. Why did I always say <laughs> HP Compact? Uh, but made HP or Dell upset. Uh, what Microsoft is doing is saying, look, uh, yeah, we'll let Google make the operating system for our phone because that's a dead end. Uh, you you only can grow so much, and if we tried to combat Google's dominance in operating systems right now, we would never catch up. It's better to become the software layer on top of Android. That's how we win, because right. Android eventually becomes commodified, uh, and and it, and we know what that's like having done Windows. Like they know what it's like when your operating system becomes commodified, and the real change in market is done on top of it. And they're like, yeah, fine, let Android have that, no problem. We we will be making more progress by selling you Office and Azure and things like that on top of it. Yeah, in a weird way, they figured out how to have their cake and eat it too. They've, they've figured yeah. out that, that all these other brands who are not mad at them for making cool hardware and new stuff can still do the thing they're going to do and they will still benefit from having their operating system everywhere and still benefit from that old relationship. And yet here's this new branch. I think it's really smart mm -hmm. of them and it was kind of maybe the only way they could go and I'm glad they, glad they figured it out. A little weird to be announcing these things more than a year <laughs> before they come out. Yeah. Uh, they did announce some stuff that is going to come out. Let's get to that. Uh, these have actual prices on them. The Surface Laptop 3, uh, and this is going to be a refrain, has a USB-C port. Uh, it keeps the 3-2 aspect ratio, the 1.3 millimeter keyboard travel. Uh, they made the trackpad 20% larger. 13.5 inch model has a quad core 10th gen Intel core processor, and there's now a 15 inch version of Laptop 3 that adds an option to have Intel or AMD Ryzen Surface Edition, which they say is the fastest AMD laptop processor made. Both models have options for a machined aluminum finish now. You can still get the Alcantara fabric if you want, and both have removable hard drives. Surface Laptop 3 starts at $999 for the 13.5 inch and $1,199 for the 15 inch. You can pre order them now, shipping October 22nd. Uh, Microsoft also announced a new Surface Pro, the Surface Pro 7. Uh, it's still a 12.3 inch convertible with a kickstand and that detachable keyboard cover has a stylus now builds in a microphone array uh, to optimize capturing your voice comes with USB-C. Big improvement is in the internals. Core i3, i5, and i7 options, up to 16 gigabytes of LPDDR4X RAM, and up to a terabyte SSD. Uh, that also means the battery life dropped on it uh, from 13.5 hours to 10.5 hours. Surface Pro 7 starts at $749, pre-ordering now, shipping October 22nd. Uh, other than, you know, USB-C finally showing up, nothing terribly stunning about these, but they're nice improvements. Yeah, it seems it seems decent. And if you're, if you're already sort of in line to get a new Surface Pro and you been following that line for a while these are nice improvements other than the loss of battery life that price is still good um i'm still very worried about how the pen performance goes with that device uh, the surface 2 is still amazing but it was a project they worked with uh wacom on now we're in new territory they haven't been really great since so um i'll have my eye on that pro 7 just to see you know how they're mm -hmm. how they're doing with that sort of thing but it's funny that USB C is like uh 
finally coming to these devices. I mean, my I feel like my whole life has converted to that. I got one or two things with like lightning and a couple of mini USBs now, but I have so many chargers now that are USB-C hanging around. Uh, I fi I feel like we're finally cresting that hill. Oh and yeah, no, we're about and, we're we're about to turn the corner to people complaining about their USB-A devices. Yeah, you know, it's been a complain, complain, complain about USB-C and dongles. Uh, especially for Apple users. And yeah. now it's going to be like, no, nah, we have USB-C. Why are people still making USB-A? I still have these old USB-A devices. Ah, I have to use a dongle to convert my USB-A device. I have to use a little thing, blah, 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 blah. So here we go. It's I'm going to call it right spin. now. It's the eternal yeah. spin. It never ends. Get used to it and just get ready to buy new cables when it's time. It's fine. Uh, Microsoft also announced a new Surface Pro, an ARM-based Surface Pro, the Surface Pro X with a custom chipset called the SQ-1 that was developed in a partnership between Microsoft and Qualcomm. The SQ-1 chipset is based on Qualcomm's existing Snapdragon 8CX laptop chip with LTE Advanced built in. It also has an integrated AI accelerator and two teraflops of graphics performance. This runs Windows 10 for ARM, uh, which can run all Windows apps, but it does some of them with instruction set translation. So there's a little bit of a performance hit, but it's generally uh, reviewed as decent. The Surface Pro X comes with two USB-C ports. <laughs> uh, it's 5.3 millimeters, weighs 774 grams. That's about 1.69 pounds. Has a 13-inch pixel sense display with 2880 by 1920 resolution at 267 PPI. The Pro X available for pre-order at 900 $99 shipping November 1st, 5th. And along with that is the Surface Slim Pen, which charges wirelessly when you slot it into the Surface Pro X's type cover keyboard. Uh, this is sold separately, but the Surface Slim Pen can do inline edits in Word, including crossing out words to delete. Uh, you can also use inking to add comments in Office documents. You can even write over cells in Excel to update numbers. And Adobe came out and did some nice inking with it as well uh, and announced support for Creative Cloud apps to work with pen in the offing. The Slim Pen ain't cheap. It's sold separately for $144.99. Yeah, it's not ex not a not a cheap deal, but it, I am very hopeful about that device. Um, it's also a little bit confusing, probably for for some hearing that oh, there's the Surface Pro X. Well, what's different between that and the seven? And there's a lot. Tom obviously just explained specs wise, but uh, this seems to be, I don't know, kind of like the Surface Pro Seven in that line is your for a bad Apple comparison. We'll say that's just iPad. Um, good iPads, right? Keep, they keep updating them. Nice new iPad this year. This is like them going fully pro, uh, at least potentially, with both power and capability. The real question is, will that pen work for a lot of the artist types that I know, myself included? And that, that needs some hands-on to see. But that demo that Adobe gave looked really promising. More promising than that, that pen or their pen tech has worked with Microsoft products for a while. So... I am personally very excited to get hands-on on this thing and see uh, how that thing goes. Integration directly with Creative Cloud is a huge deal there. And um, I think it would be worth it for creative professionals if it does, if it can perform the way that they're showing. They really did focus a lot, though, on like, well, you're using Office, right? Here's a way to mark up your stuff in Word. And that's great. And maybe the primary uh, aim of this is, you know, business users and that sort of thing. Um, but where I'm where I'm really curious is that, you know, the creative apps and how they're going to run. And so we'll see, I guess. And that price is, I mean, while expensive, not that expensive, it's all right. You know, if this is truly a, a, a big jump for them in that pen tech, 144 is okay. I could see yeah, that. Yeah. And, and I, and I know the presentation definitely made it seem like the surface pro seven is the old and the surface pro X is the new, but it's really just a chip difference. It's, it's right. arm versus Intel. So they were doing a lot to make the pro X sound powerful because it has arm in it. Uh, and I, I think the Pro 7's probably still more powerful. I mean, certainly that inking demonstration that they did with the Pro 7, they they didn't have to go, and wow, look, it can even do this. Uh, it was just showing you what it could do. Where I was with the Pro X, there was a lot of like, it's got an ARM processor, but it can still do this. So I'm, I'm very curious what the uh, benchmarks of this will end up being uh, once people put it through its paces. But but you're right, uh, it's, it's a lovely laptop, a uh, little bit of a higher price point, uh, than the Pro 7, uh, but they're, they're throwing a lot of bells and whistles into it. And yep. and like you say, that Surface Slim Pen sure sounds good, but boy, it's pricey. 
Well, and everything comes down to latency in the in the in the category that I'm talking about. And I bring this up a lot when we have stuff on the show about this sector. But like for example, the iPad Pros, which have been pretty strong for artists, so is the pencil. They just had a free OS update taking the, the thing from out of iOS and forking it into iPad OS. And for whatever reason, and they announced it on stage, but for whatever reason, the latency went way down and it's mm -hmm. so it's already faster and it was already yep. kind of top in class for latency so they have a lot to live up to in that regard um if they can win on that level they've already got like full creative cloud support they'll ha that they'll also have all of the other windows apps that are already well established as competitors mm -hmm. in the art space like generally i think this is a, a real shot over the bow of that particular market i just don't know how big that market is i don't know how much microsoft wants it the their studio desktop model didn't do that great sales wise also didn't perform very well this could be the one uh and maybe by pushing it as a more general use device like the ipad is you'll get more out of it i don't know this is going to be fun to yeah. watch i can't wait to yeah if that graphics performance pays off like they're saying if that ai accelerator works like they're saying this is going to be a compelling machine mm -hmm. uh finally we must acknowledge the surface earbuds uh the the wireless earbuds announced to des design to work with microsoft Op office you can do powerpoint slide forwarding voice transcription and live translation in 60 languages right from your earbuds they offer one-click pairing with Microsoft devices uh, and even work with Spotify on Android for quick music playback. So you don't have to press play. You just launch Spotify. It knows the earbuds are on and starts playing. Uh, promise 24 hours of battery life. Uh, and they're coming later this year for $249. They also are not going to blend into your ears. <laughs> they're huge. I mean, a lot of people made fun of AirPods, and I, and I think it's a fair uh, thing. But th these things are just gnarly. In fact, I would say this. If you were always tempted to get ear gauges, you know, cutting out your, your lobe and really That's blowing right, out ear gauges, gauges, yeah. this will at least look like you've done it. Um, they could go right into your ear gauges. <laughs> I actually think these look like they'll be lost less. They'll fall out less. Like there's mm -hmm. some benefits to the size. The battery life is probably the biggest, but um, I don't know, man. <laughs> They're big old discs in your head, and I'm not sure that's going to work for me. But, you know, somebody's got 250 out there. Give it well, a As Roger minutes. pointed out in our pre-show, you won't lose them. No. <laughs> not as easily. <laughs> uh, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Checking out the mailbag, uh, we actually got a voicemail. Uh, yesterday, I posited that Apple wasn't worried about not getting tariff exemptions for its Mac Pro parts, for some of them anyway, because they could source them from outside China, and they likely knew the parts wouldn't get exemptions. Well, James Thatcher, a.k.a. Big Jim, called us from his car on the way to present at a conference to give us his expertise on the topic. With regard to yesterday's show and Apple not getting some exemptions but getting other exemptions, Tom, I think you're half right. I think that Apple most definitely is planning on sourcing those items from either somewhere in Asia or probably somewhere in uh, Mexico. And my only reason for that guess is just because of the proximity to the border, maybe it's easier to do it that way. With regard to did they have some kind of conversation with the USTR, I find it highly unlikely, and here's why. Every company I have talked to who has submitted trade exemption requests, and there have been several, none of them that I have talked to have had a conversation with the USTR uh, or their office. Uh, if it was done, it was either done completely open and in public, or it was put on the exemption request specifically. Uh, but that's just my two cents for tech and trade. And yes, tech and trade is still around. We're still kicking. We're not dead yet. Visit us at the trader. That's the trader.com. I'm big Jim. Uh, that's great. So I guess my best guess knowing that now that I have big Jim's expertise weighing in on this is maybe they just knew that those parts might not get approval, might not get exemptions. I, I, I'm, I, I'm still holding to the idea that I don't think Apple was shocked and is now suddenly upset uh, I, I think they probably planned for that, but thank you. Thank you, big Jim. Yeah, that was awesome. I wasn't part of that conversation obviously because I wasn't here, but the, um, I was just stunned by the idea that, Hey, they're going to build them in Texas. And I went, didn't they already do that? The month, the one I have over here, the old yeah. pro can, no, is they, they were building them in, in Austin and yeah. then they decided they were no longer going to build them in Austin. And then when the tariffs came along, they changed their mind and now they're yeah. going to keep building them in Austin. All right. Well, good luck. And I can't afford your new Mac. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it's meant for you, really, no, anymore, no. weirdly. Not anymore, um, it isn't. The old one yeah. kind of was. I don't know. Those guys, they got to figure that out. 
Well, a uh, big shout out to patrons at our master and grand master levels, including Andrew Bradley, Dustin Campbell, and Paul Boyer. Thanks for your support of the show. And thank you, Scott Johnson, for joining us. What's going on to tell folks about? Oh, it's a lot of things. And I know I keep teasing this, but uh, if uh, we're getting closer, um, we're not sure we're using Kickstarter now because of some controversy at Kickstarter. We may be using something else, but uh, my board game slash card game is coming out. It's called Rock Runners. It's uh, available, at least some details about it, some pictures of it. I have an actual test deck here that works, and it's great. Uh, all the artwork's completed. You can find that over at frogpants.com slash rockrunners. Uh, it's a really fun game for quick five-round uh, games with friends, up to four people. Uh, and I love it, and I can't wait to get this thing out there. But uh, head on over there, uh, bookmark it, and soon you'll figure out how you can get them. For everything else you're looking for, frogpants.com. And, of course, I am on Twitter, at Scott Johnson. We have new Patreon rewards. You just heard one of them. Shout outs in the show. Uh, become a member of DTNS and you could get a peek at our show rundown as we develop it. You could have been watching as I was fumbling around with all those Microsoft announcements today. Uh, behind the scenes chats and more. And on November 1st, everybody who is at the $2 level or above will get a PDF copy of the official DTNS Good Day Internet Cookbook with recipes from the show hosts and even some listeners. Sign up now at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young and special guest Tony Stanley uh, to give us some idea of what the trends in fintech are these days. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>